Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're having a lovely day. Before we get into today's video, this is not a green screen. This is not a green screen. This is a Pure Air VLF48. This is a clean room bench. And these are what we use for doing hard drive data recovery. Or admittedly, you know, if you wanted to do an LCD only screen replacement and you don't want to get any dust inside of it, it's also good for that. You could replace heads and hard drives, all sorts of stuff like that. Usually the camera's very close to me and I'm very close to the to the back wall, but here, since there's some distance between the back wall and myself and the camera and myself, it, it, it's easier to give you the illusion that it's a green screen. You don't usually get to see most of my shop. 99% of the time, you're looking at pretty much me sitting in a blue chair or me sitting in one of the chairs of my shop. I just didn't feel like messing around with the cameras too much today, so I didn't decide to move the camera over. So the topic of today's video is going to be a rant on the repair industry. I used to do a lot more of these when I first started the channel. You'd be able to see that if YouTube didn't remove the feature that allows you to sort videos oldest to newest on a channel. I don't know why they removed that. I thought that was a cool feature. But anyway, today's video is just going to be a rant on the fact that the ladder that I climbed to get where I am in the repair industry is gone. If the me of 2009 wanted to try again in 2023, the path that I took to success is literally gone. And this was kind of blackpilling, so I just kind of wanted to rant on it a little bit. So the repair that I first started doing about 14 to 15 years ago was the A1150 MacBook, A1181 MacBook screen repair. I had about 200 bucks in the bank, $250 around there, and about 1,000 bucks in credit card debt. And I had a credit score that was hovering somewhere around a Tennessee area code. So I wasn't about to borrow money anytime soon. The repairs that I did at the time were very basic like screen replacement on an A1150 MacBook or an A1181, where I could buy a screen for those devices for like 90, 90 bucks or $120. And once I was able to buy them in bulk, I could get the price down to somewhere as low as $58 to $72. This meant that I could charge a customer $160 for a repair, I could make $100 for 10 minutes of my time, and I could make the customer happy. Because at the time, what Apple used to do is they would charge the customer anywhere from $350 to $750 for the small model and like $700 to $1,200 for the larger model, and they would replace the entire display assembly. The display assembly is different from the screen. The display assembly has the webcam, it has the bezel, it has the screen, which I need, but it also has the, the screen cable, webcam cable, Wi-Fi cable, antenna, bezel that says MacBook on it, uh, you know, hinges, um, the, the back cover. I don't need all this stuff. The only thing that's broken is the customer's screen. I just want to replace the customer's screen. And the ability for me to replace only what was broken, the ability for me to tell the customer, this is what's broken, this is what I'm fixing, I'm not replacing everything else that doesn't have to be replaced, made customers happy and it made them willing to come to me in a park so that they could save five or six hundred dollars and also not have to wait one to two weeks, but rather get the device back in 10 minutes. It allowed me to grow a business from nothing. And this was a great thing. I could buy my LP-133 WX1 TLA-1s. I wasn't buying them straight from LG. I couldn't go to LG.com and click Contact Us and buy 100 screens. I couldn't go to Apple and buy the screen. But you could always buy. These are always LG brokers that would sell to somebody that would sell to somebody that would eventually sell to a schmuck like me. And even if I couldn't get the original screen, at times, you know, laptops discontinued. If I can't find an LP-133 WX1 TLA-1, maybe I'll buy a Samsung LTN-133 AT01, or maybe I'll buy an AU Optronics B133 EW01, or maybe, just mind blown, I'll buy a screen that didn't originally go into the computer, like an LP-133 WX1 TLN3. <gasps> And I'll have to tell the customer that if you want to be able to have brightness control, you'll have to install OS X Leopard instead of Tiger. No big deal. Nobody cared. It was fine. The screen looked the same as the original. I could color calibrate it, so if they had an AU Optronics originally, now they have an LG. Color calibrate it, make it look nice, and they were happy. Now, a few years passed and things started to get a little bit more difficult. In 2010, with the A1369 and A1370 MacBook Air, you were no longer replacing a screen. That was an easy job. This is something that was so simple, I used to be able to do it in the park with nothing but a Phillips Zero screwdriver and a little bendy tool that you could get inside of Radio Shack soldering iron. You know the little yellow or red pokey tool you could get with a Radio Shack $9 soldering iron back in the day? I used to use that to put the inverter wire back into the inverter board of an A1181 MacBook because I could never get the clutch cover to come off and go back on right. I could just never do that. So I would just pull the clutch cover a little bit and use that little pokey tool to get the inverter wire in. And I would do this in Herald Square Park because I couldn't afford an office at the time and my apartment was way too far from Midtown Manhattan for anybody to come to my place. So yeah, I literally did this in the park. Like, not kidding. This is a picture back when I had a hairline almost 15 years ago of me doing this repair in the park because it was just that easy. And if you know, the customer's battery was dead and they wanted to see that it worked, I would you know, take an extension cord out of my backpack 
you know, plug it into around Herald Square Park to an electrical outlet that nobody's supposed to know is there and steal electricity from the city for two minutes so that I could show my customer the device worked again. But on to 2010. In 2010, the air came out. And here, it's not just a couple of screws and one wire you got to plug in anymore. It is this, this weird thing over here. This is not a full-fledged screen. This is literally just the front layer, the part that makes the picture. But it has no, it, th th there's no white on the back of it. There's no backlight reflector or diffuser. There's no backlight itself. It's literally just the screen. And it's not held in with screws. It's held in with this really annoying double-sided adhesive. And there's a bezel that goes over it that is not screwed in, but it's in there, or clipped in. It's in there with adhesive. And you can't bend the bezel at all, or it's not going to go back on right, and the customer will be mad. And you have to come up with a way to take this out on one piece. Even though it's cracked, it's got to come out in one piece, because if it doesn't, you're going to get this on the backlight layer. And the moment that a broken little piece of this falls in the backlight layer, it leaves a mark there. And the customer can see that, and if they see it, they don't want to pay for the repair. So this is a much more difficult repair to do. Not just because of that, but also because it was difficult to find the part. What I'm holding right now is a B116XW05 V0. This did not come out until 2012 for us to be able to buy. The computer came out in 2010, but we couldn't buy the part until 2012. It actually took until 2013 for the 13-inch version, which was the lp 132 wp one tja or TJA1 to come out for us to be able to buy. So for the first three years that this computer was out, I had to tell people, I'm sorry, I can't help you because I can't buy the screen. But once they finally came out, they weren't available to just everyone. They were only available if you were willing to buy 200 or 300 or 400. The people that actually sold these, they were not going to sell to you unless you were going to wire them, you know, twenty to sixty thousand dollars. Now, luckily, this was five years after I had started out, so I didn't have two hundred dollars in the bank and a four hundred credit score anymore. I was doing a little bit better for myself, so I actually could do that based on where I was before. So that first rung kind of fell off of the ladder. It wasn't as easy to get to where I was anymore. The, again, a lot of the money that I was able to make that I was able to spend on these hot air stations and all this data recovery shit, a lot of it in the beginning, just being able to hire somebody so that I could sit there and learn how to do this stuff, came from the money that I made doing those simple repairs back in the day where I could start doing repairs, literally 200 bucks in the bank, and that's it. Now, I needed to buy a lot more. But I did. I bought a lot. You know, I, I bought something like 200 or 600 screens, some for the A1398, A1502, and A1369 and 70. And I had something like six or 800 screens in the store at the time based on literally putting my life savings into buying seventy dollars or $80,000 worth of screens, because that's what my life savings was 10 years ago. So I pretty much spent all of my money on screens. And we were able to do these repairs for several years. Not the easiest thing, but again, doable. Now let's go over to the newer machines. The newer machines that you get have a very similar construction. You know, again, th obviously the technology has evolved a bit since then. It's higher resolution, better quality and all that. But it's the same general idea of this screen that's held in with the adhesive and all that, and uh, the same concept in terms of it being much harder to find. With this screen, I could go to an LG broker, ask for an LP133WP1TLA1, and a lot of them are going to tell me no, but one of them is eventually going to say, yeah, we could sell you a thousand here. Uh, but with these, for the newer MacBook Pros and the newer MacBook Airs, they're nowhere. They're nowhere. The only thing that you can find are uh, the worst of the worst when it comes to factory rejects that look so bad that you would be embarrassed trying to sell this for a customer, even if you were doing the repair for free. I wouldn't want to do the repair for free knowing I was putting this garbage into a customer's computer. See, back in the day, Apple could say, well, those are not good screens or those are knockoffs, and it was always bullshit. You could see the model number on what they put in, LP133WP1TJA. The model number of what I put in, LP133WP1TJA. They look the same. There's no stuck pixels. There's no lines. There's no blotches. It's a good screen. And again, I was not buying the LG screens with the 9 on the box. You know what the 9 means. So the 5, the, the, the 9 is the, is the kiss of death. But even when you get the screens with the 9 on the box, that just means that 1 out of 20 is going to have a stuck pixel. So what we would do, in the case that we were unlucky enough to get one box that had a 9 on it, we would pre-test them all, see which ones had stuck pixels. If it had no stuck pixels, it goes in this pile. If it had stuck pixels, it goes in this pile. If you're a customer that wants to pay, you get one of these screens. If you're a customer that says, I only have 40 bucks in my pocket, I give you one of these screens. And again, people with only 40 bucks in their pocket, if I say, hey, by the way, this is going to have a stuck pixel or two on it, are you okay with that? 
100% of them to say, I just need something to work on. And they're happy to take one of these. But with even the ones with one or two stock pixels, they were usable. They weren't garbage. These ones that you can get nowadays are complete and utter shit. You can't buy the same thing that went into the computer. It doesn't exist. There are people that will claim it exists. And in my opinion, these people are... Mm, I question their integrity or their eyesight. One of them has to be failing if they think that that is a good screen. So what you have to do is you have to buy assemblies. Now, again, what made us competitive back in the day? I'm not replacing the whole assembly. I'm only replacing what is broken, which is the screen. This allows me to charge less money. This allows me to do a better job for you. I'm replacing less parts. I'm being more efficient. I can do the job faster, and it's going to cost you less money. Since I'm buying the screen from one of the manufacturer's brokers, I can actually buy, give you something that is new. The screen that I put in is not used. It will be new. Now, with the newer machines, these LCDs by themselves, again, not only, they're all crap. So what do you have available? You have new LCDs, assemblies, from Apple, which are insanely expensive, and they're not selling them to me. You have used assemblies, which again, if you're looking at like good quality assemblies for the 14-inch MacBook Pro or the A2141, the 16-inch one even a year or two ago, like really good quality used ones, very expensive. We are no longer talking about a part cost of 39 to 120 bucks. We're talking about like three or four or five hundred dollars part by itself, whole assembly. And it's used, so it's going to have marks on it from the last owner. Or you can get a refurbished assembly where they claim they refurbish it with a new LCD where they take this and they replace the LCD for you, but they're replacing it with one of those knockoff piece of shit screens that looks horrible. You know, I was just looking at my website and I was just realizing how much of this website is a complete lie. Like I said, I use grade A screens. That was true a few years ago. It says that we do not use used screens. We only use new LCDs. That was true like three or four years ago. Now, I have to tell customers that the only thing I can give you is a used screen. I used to tell people that the reason that we are price competitive is because we only replace the exact part that needs to be replaced, which is the LCD, not the entire assembly. Not true, because I can't buy this anymore. I used to say that all my parts were grade A straight from the manufacturer. Not true. They were taken from a recycled MacBook that came out of a scrapyard or something. My entire website, like the entire section of what it is that makes us better than the competition, that makes us a good value, doesn't apply anymore. And there was something about that in realizing that it's not that way because of some sort of greed on our part or because we've gotten lazy, but literally because the parts to do those jobs no longer exist. That was kind of depressing. So if somebody wanted to get into the business that I'm in right now, and follow in my footsteps, literally every rung on that ladder is currently gone. The first rung, it is easy to buy a screen and easy to replace it. Gone. Second rung, it is difficult to buy a screen and difficult to replace it, but you can do it. Gone. It is impossible to buy a screen and difficult to replace it. That's the rung that we're at now. Now, I do not need this as a business to survive. It would be nice to be able to have that, but I don't need it. The thing that makes me depressed is when you look around this shop, when you look at all of the stuff, all the equipment that we have here, I'll just spin the camera around cheesily once so that you can see what this place looks like. All the tools on all these desks, the PC3000s, the stuff for the micro SD card recoveries, all the things that you see on all these desks, all of this stuff was paid for with money that we made from things that people getting into this profession newly will not be able to do. So now that I'm here, I can still do these repairs. If a hard drive is clicking, I have all the equipment that I need to recover it, which is very expensive. If somebody walks in with a micro SD card that is cracked, but they need that data for a court case, we can get that data back with very expensive equipment that took us a lot of time to learn how to use. If you have a motherboard that's burned, we can fix that motherboard that's burned using, again, a skill set that we learned over a long period of time and equipment that is very expensive. I have all the equipment. How does somebody getting into this field get all that equipment if they started where I did with nothing but $200 in the bank and no credit? They don't. They don't. This was a really, really great pathway to get into the more intricate repairs. This was a great industry because you could start at the lowest level doing the low-hanging fruit 
and make, you know, kind of a basic ass living off of doing the low hanging fruit. But if you were really ambitious, you could take those low hanging fruit repairs, stash away your money and use that to buy equipment, also to buy time to learn how to do the rest. Because again, for me to be, have the luxury to sit in my office and not fix screens all day, I needed to hire a Milan, I needed to hire, you know, if I wanted the luxury to not talk to customers all day, I needed to hire a Steve. The money for that came from doing these repairs. The money for the equipment for all these advanced repairs came from money I made grinding out on the basic repairs, staying in my office until one or two in the morning, day after day after day, doing house calls back before I could afford an office, day after day after day until one or three in the morning. It, and that's literally gone. And the part that's kind of depressing is it's not gone because technology has evolved. Because there are people that are going to say that I'm just simply pining for the days when laptops were three megahertz and eight inches thick or some nonsense like that. It's not just that the repair is difficult, because that's fine. We'll, we'll figure it out. The problem is that you can't buy the part. It's impossible to buy the part. They have succeeded at locking independent repairers out of the supply chain. And the part that I find so ironic about this is my first video uh, where I like, like right to repair really kind of entered my consciousness. So that was about nine years and two months ago. It was my first video on this topic. And when I think about it, nine years and three months ago, it was actually easier to start a repair business than it is now. After nine years of advocacy, like I put pretty much everything on how to run my company online, how to do all the difficult screen repairs, how to do all the difficult board repairs. Pretty much all of it is documented on repair.wiki. How to deal with running a repair business. I have an entire playlist on you know, all the little things that you're going to come up with if you try to run a business like this. Putting everything out there to try to make it as easy as possible for somebody else to start, the most blackpilling and depressing thing is that 10 years later, it is actually harder. How much have we actually accomplished? Have we made it easier for people to get out there and do what it is that we do? How much of it is on us versus the companies? Is there any reversing that? Do people care for that to be reversed? Because one of the things that I really wanted to do with this YouTube channel is I wanted to make it easier for people who are watching to kind of climb that ladder. Because I had a problem when I was younger of finding something that I was really good at, some area where I could genuinely add value to society and get paid for doing it. And once I found something where I could genuinely add value to society, make people happy, and make money doing it, and pay other people money to do it, I thought, let's spread that to as many people as possible. Let's make it as easy for as many people as possible to be able to do that. And there's something that's really, really depressing, looking back and realizing that over the past 10 years, we've actually taken a step backward. You are less likely to be successful starting a business like this in 2023 than you were in 2009 or in 2013 when I made that first video talking about right to repair. I don't know, there's something about that that just seems wrong. And the, the sad thing about it is a lot of people, one of the things I'll hear a lot, and you'll see this on Reddit from all like Apple Insider-ish kind of the like comment sections and stuff is, I want right to repair to pass. I want this to become a thing because I want to make money and destroy all the other businesses. This is just because it's good for me. And the thing that aggravates me about that is if it doesn't pass, honestly, I'll probably still be okay. I can still do all these other jobs. Again, I have the equipment. I have the personnel that are trained. They've, I have the equipment, the parts, everything. I have the stuff that I need to run a sustainable business. Somebody who is just starting out today, they don't have all this stuff. They need to find a place to start. They need to be able to do those low-hanging fruit repairs that don't require the highest level of skill or those low-hanging fruit repairs that require a lot of skill, but you can buy one part rather than having to buy two or four or 600. They're not going to be able to start where I am right now. Where I am right now, I'm good. But I'm not just thinking about myself when I do these videos, when I do the educational content, when I pay people to write Wikipedia articles for the nonprofit. Who are you staring at? Yo, go back to UT. I'm not doing these videos just for me. I'm doing these videos because when people send me letters showing me the pictures of the repair shop they started saying, you know, like I used to work at Walmart making minimum wage and now I make $90,000 working part time. Thank you. I started my own business. I can do things on my own terms. I can spend more time with my family. I paid off my debt. Stuff like that. Those are the things that make life worth living. Knowing that you've put something out there that allows other people to lead a better life than they'd otherwise be able to live. That's what takes life from, you know, your average day to day. Okay, I'm just going to do whatever I do every day and that's that. To really having a genuine feeling of purpose. 
I can continue doing what I do, whether or not these type of legislation passes and whether or not these parts are made available. I have enough, I, I, I know this is going to come off as so fucking self-serving, but I have enough clout and I have enough reputation that, and I have enough stuff here that I'm set. My business is going to be fine. The people who are not going to be fine are the people who have no rung to start on. And when you look at the entire repair landscape right now, so many people do not have that first rung on the ladder that I did back in 2008 and 2009 to start climbing. And I want to see them have that rung. I want to see people being able to start out doing the stuff that I did. I want to see people able to do those repairs in a park the same way that I did because they can buy the parts and they can get access to what they need to be able to satisfy their customers. Again, my business will survive. If I have to delete that screen repair page on my website, that's fine by me. I'm, I'm going to be sad doing it, but I could delete that page from my site. I could stop offering that as a service, and I'm good tomorrow. But is the new person, is the new person going to be good at that? Probably not. And I'm just kind of repeating myself at this point. So I'm going to end the video because, honestly, thinking about this is kind of depressing, and I'd like to go out and enjoy my Saturday. That's it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now.